Okay, uh, my name is Bunrat. I am a teacher, professor at Chulalongkorn University and also did a spin-off company called Meticuli, which is a medical device that is customized for patients. Uh, we are six years old and in almost 10 countries now at the moment. We have received the US FDA approval and now are about to expand into many more countries. Thank you for the time. Thanks for having me. Hi, uh, my name is Hyokte. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Pine Venture Partners. We are licensed uh, as a manager in Singapore, uh, and we invest in um, companies that are making our lives he healthier and happier, and a lot in the um, preschool areas as well, in content, toys, licensed goods, and pet area as well. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Dr. Pong Thon. Uh, right now, I hold position as a VMS Health Research Center. So I work for VMS, uh, the largest healthcare operator in Thailand. We own 52 hospitals in Thailand and Cambodia. Uh, another hand, I also uh, have my own investment in startup and also help startup to achieve their goal, especially in healthcare. So yeah, thanks for inviting me here. Okay, so I guess uh, we'll make it uh, a little bit more interactive. Uh, so if you have any questions or any comments or questions uh, to ask any of us, uh, all from healthcare, from slightly different angles, please feel free to raise your hands and I think one of the team will give you the microphone. But uh, perhaps we we'll start off with uh, the question at hand, right? Which is how has the healthcare industry changed especially in the post-pandemic era. So maybe we'd like to hear from, from Ajahn Pong Thon first, from, from the operator point of view. Yeah. Uh, he's very humble, but BDMS is actually world's number three hospital chain. Uh, very big and uh, you know very proud for Thailand. Thank you. Come home. Yeah, so um, I think healthcare industry has been changed dramatically after COVID era because before COVID, everybody think healthcare that we have to go physically to the hospitals. And we focus more on uh, when we're gonna perform surgery, when we're gonna get medication treatment, or how we're gonna get paid in, in hospital. But during COVID era, we have learned that actually as a patient, uh, when, it, when time is critical, we need to access to healthcare no matter what. So if the bed is not available, how can you access that? And that's when the telemedicine come into a real action. So during the COVID time, VMS doesn't have enough faith to uh, provide care to all patients who need it. So uh, we, we start to use our telehealth, which we already have the telehealth platform for five years, but we never use it actually, because we don't see uh, the benefit of that. But then during the COVID time, say, yeah, right now it's, it's about time. And the other trend that we actually see from the COVID is people start to know more about their health. They're concerned more about their physical health, their emotional health. And then they start to learn and get themselves educated about healthcare. So I think that that's a real paradigm shift in healthcare that we're gonna see more and more. Okay, well, what about you? Um, you are multinationals, I guess, you know, you invest in Korea, in Singapore, Southeast Asia. What have you seen has, has been changed in the last few years? Yeah, I think there are a lot of uh, consistent themes uh, with cultural differences. But one of them, I think, is the general conscious level on the health and on the, um, there's two sides, right? The prevention side as well as treatment side. And then also on the prevention side, a lot of interest around that eating healthier and also wash your hands a little bit more. Uh, I think that's important. So we're, we're investing in the companies that are working on the preventative side to make sure that you don't get sick in the first place. So I think that's important. Um, we also see a lot of trend definitely on the video conferencing. People um, tele consultation and medication delivery is becoming um, a much more of a norm for those that you don't have to go to hospitals if we can um, do it and people are very used to used to it now, uh, having worked in at work from home uh, as a no, new norm. Uh, people are used to it, um, and yeah, I think uh, these two are the key trends I see uh, post pandemic. Wow, thank you. Uh, for me, uh, coming from the university, and I also helped a lot of 
hospitals in Thailand during the COVID time. Uh, I also see one thing that has been amazing, very, very positive, which is the advancements of medical science. We have seen a lot of sharing of the knowledge of how, for example, how to treat the patients or how to diagnose for COVID. Uh, have, we have a lot more publications. I guess all the researchers stayed at home and uh, practitioners, they, when they practice in their hospital setups, they publish their papers and being shared in open source. So there's a lot uh, open knowledge and people would just grab on that and then apply that to their own hospitals. And this is also how mRNA and a lot of other things could realize and could change our society today. Uh, we've seen a lot that was supposed to happen maybe 10 years from now is happening right now. Uh, working from home, now we are thinking about how to shift back to work from the office, right? Uh, at, there were times that we, we thought that work, work from home was great, but some companies now trying to, to pull people back to, into the office. Uh, one thing that I see very, very clearly as the, the trend uh, post the pandemic is the decentralization of the healthcare. Uh, as you mentioned before, before uh, is the preventive, right? And after is, is the treatment. Uh, we've seen a lot of the trends like that. And uh, we work with a few countries around the world now. Uh, different cultures, slightly different treatments. Uh, you've seen China, it's struggling a little bit about the, the vaccines, right? But uh, the country is opening up again. Uh, some countries have been open for two or three years now, like the UK or Germany. Uh, we see changes in the regulations uh, in Europe in particular with the CE mark system, with the MDD. It's shifting towards the MDR uh, before it was a directive. The R, the MD, the last D is directive. The MDR is the regulations now. So with this regulation, it means a lot more uh, clinical investigations, a lot more tests, and that probably means the slowing down of the innovation in, in Europe, actually, in, in the EU countries. But so I, so I we see a lot more USFDA right now. I think yeah. it's going to be the opposite end, because uh, what, I, what I actually see is, uh, during the COVID pandemic, people are struggling, and once when you struggle, you actually become more innovative. So actually, during the COVID, I have discuss with new startups, I heard new ideas that I never heard or never see the trend before. So what I actually think is right after the pandemic of the COVID, we're going to have more medical equipment that we never ever imagined about. Think about the EKG. During the COVID time, you cannot go to a hospital and get EKG. So what if you have chest pain, what you're going to, what you're going to do? Right, and now you can see that we we have uh, EKG readers that actually use at portable at home, right? During the COVID time, you want to know your oxygen saturation, and now in, in the past the oxygen reader is very expensive, but now you can buy from Lazada, you can buy from Shopee, right? So I think in the future, uh, not so far away, the medical equipment will be something cheaper, more available, more accessible, and not necessary to be used in healthcare. And because of the COVID, the regulation has changed, as you mentioned, but it changed into the way that people can get, get, get into the technology that they want, no matter what. And I think that that can be another trend that you have to think about. The other trend that it just popped up in my head after you, you, uh, you both talking about, I think because people work from home more, in my idea, another five or 10 years, we may see the shift change in disease and chronic illness because people have more time for themselves, they eat better. So maybe we can see the slight trend shift. Maybe we have less diabetes, maybe we have less hypertension. Who knows? I don't know. I mean, this is just my guess. What about you? Has your lifestyle changed a bit since the COVID time? Well, as a tech VC, I, I'm always very used to working from home, even before COVID started. So nothing really changed uh, during COVID time. But uh, I think the, the rest of the world sort of are now very okay with uh, this type of remote work. Um, but I think people, what I value a lot in terms of this new post-pandemic is a lot of the work that can be done 
by yourself uh, will be done or be automated. Um, and then when we have this type of uh, human experience, we really cherish the time and be really in the moment and really maximize the time we have as humans. So I think with the acceleration of AI and everything, um, this type of uh, qualitative experiences among the humans will only be more emphasized going forward. And I think healthcare also what I see a lot in the uh, general tech is w as well. We work with leading uh, automobile companies as well. Um, I think healthcare as a boundary is uh, becoming a, a little bit blur. So, so we used to think healthcare only at the hospital. Now it has come to our mobile, mobile devices. But also when you're driving, let's say you talked about heart attack. Maybe you have a heart attack. What do you do? You need the, 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 the car needs to be smart enough to slow down and start going to the sideways. And now this type of technology is becoming more common and common. I think Tesla is already doing it. Other automobile companies like Hyundai is also working on it. And yeah, you, you sit on the chair. So you already can actually extract a lot of information about the body as you drive or when you sit on a chair. So a lot of these general companies will incorporate the healthcare as one of their edge as well to sell more products. Yeah. Well, we are on the verge of uh, AI as well. So maybe you could continue your comments a little bit about how you see AI and digital trends is, are changing how healthcare industry works. Yeah, um, we haven't made an investment, but we're we're constantly looking at um, investment deals in uh, companies that are collecting a lot of data about the end patients, whether it's human or one of my portfolio, which is Zoombet. They already have the most amount of data on uh, on dogs and cats as well. So. One of actually our bottleneck is connecting the pet owners with the vets. But there are a globally severe shortage of vets right now. However, when we have enough database built into our system, we start to get triaging done. And even for our um, medication refill, we actually would go through, use the AI as much, and then the vet just need to sign off on it to prescribe to save a lot of time because they're just getting the same medication anyway. So I think it's coming and it's already here, but it's gonna get just better and better. Well, from from my perspective, it's, it's also quite hopeful as well. Uh, I think all of us know that AI has two major components. One is the data set, and the other one is the model. Uh, from the data set point of view, I think we've seen a lot of data collection right now. Uh, people post the data sets, online platform, uh, you could download, you could do a lot of manipulations with the data set. At the same time, uh, with the models, now with the, the advent of AI, the model that people are publishing right now, usually is about old as it being published right away. So every six months or so, there's a new model that is a lot more effective, that is a lot more accurate. So uh, we have seen a lot of models being posted right now online. Uh, there are several AI conferences that are focusing on healthcare, and we've seen a lot of possibilities and opportunities in, in this arena as well. But for me, I, I, as a healthcare practitioner, I, I still work as a doctor, I think we put our hope too much on AI. And right now, we think that AI can solve the problem in healthcare, which I don't think that it's gonna, it gonna be true in at least in ten, five or ten years. You cannot do that. But of course, AI with a, a very good model, when you collect enough data, you can see the pattern. You can use the model to predict. But in medicine, you cannot have 100% accurate prediction because each individual have their own genetic background. They have their own behavior, they have their, their own multifactorial. So AI not gonna solve all the problems. So I'm so happy that as a doctor, AI not gonna replace me for sure, right? But we can we can think about how we can use AI to help healthcare practitioner like doctor and nurse to speed up our work, to care more patients, and then spend more quality time with patients. And that, I, I think this is, this is how new startup should look at the AI in this way rather than 
to propose that AI gonna replace a healthcare provider because you're not gonna be successful on that. Yeah. The other thing is we collect too much data, but then with artificial intelligence, you still need people to question it. But if you put the wrong question, you're not gonna get the right model. And that's the reason why you have a lot of healthcare models that have been published and then die away and no one's sustainable because you always put the wrong question about it. But then, yeah, that's the thing that we have to think about how we re-look at AI in healthcare. Well, for me, uh, we our company actually uses AI to do the image processing. We get the CT scans, we get the MRI, and we use AI to quickly change those into the digital file, uh, digital twin of, of your body. And then we use another machine learning AI engine to design the implant. Uh, so that speeds up the, the process significantly. Of course, we're not gonna replace the surgeons, the orthopedic surgeons, the neurosurgeons, but the implants are now being designed within seconds. And, and that allowed us to manufacture and deliver the implants almost on demand, uh, less than seven days here in Thailand and in Southeast Asia. So that, that is just one my one of the take that I, I feel like AI has helped us a lot. And we got one of the best databases in the world right now because we are collecting CT scans data. But then when you when you try to collect the database as big as you plan, you have to think about multifactorial in human being as well because each entity uh, have their own uh, anomaly, right? So with even one single bone in Kokesoi, in Africans or in Asians, they have a slightly change in angle, size, right? And also uh, curvature of the bones. So that, that kind of thing that you have to keep in mind as well when you develop uh, your AI. You have to look through the data and understand uh, the difference in those. Well, I guess it's time to uh, share with the audience or if the audience has any questions you might have and like to ask or share your opinion. Otherwise, raise your hands. <laughs> Otherwise, I, I have a question to um, ask uh, in, for VC, for venture capital. What do you actually foresee in healthcare investment in the future? You're going to invest in a uh, healthcare operator, or you're going to invest in healthcare insurance, or you're going to invest in what? Well, the answer is very simple. Whatever can generate the most amount of return for my clients, I, that's my mandate. But obviously there's the operator, there's the equipment. Um, I get ton of deals around a new breakthrough vaccine. And I have to read like so many uh, white papers and uh, medication supplements. There's a lot going on. But what's promising is that, uh, especially in Asia, um, the general population is getting older. But this particular baby boomer um, sectors have a lot of disposable income, so I think that's that's good. Uh, what's that? That's the good side. The the bad side, the difficult side for me is that the healthcare industry, and I'm not a practitioner or industry people like you. It takes a long time to get to the market. One because there's a lot of R&D that needs to be done, and also the approvals take long time require a lot of funding Two, before you can get directly to the to the end consumer you have to usually go through b2b2c so that convincing the stakeholders in the industry take time as well so that makes my investment uh, work a little bit more difficult but it's a good industry uh, in general yes. I noticed there are quite a bit of startups in the audience maybe you would share with them your ticket size and the stage of the startup that you invest in. So maybe they could come talk to you. Yeah, so we usually invest from Series A onwards when the company is ready to take on an institutional capital. We usually like to get involved. Uh, that's a one differentiating factor for us. We usually get into the board, uh, board of directors. And, and when we invest, we like to build a value creation plan together. To, how do we capture the value, whether it's a cross-border expansion or through partnerships, looking for suppliers or uh, manufacturing OEM partners. So yeah, yeah, we usually invest like 1 million and above. Yeah. Uh, I have to speak on behalf of BDMS because BDMS also interests in investment in startup as well. 
uh, but we not only invest only in Series A upwards. I mean, if you have idea, you have a good technology in your mind, you already have uh, some proof of concept, we can fund you in terms of research because I'm a head of the research for BDMS. So we can collaborate with you to fund you uh, because we interest in co-own the patent. Uh, we made a little bit different from VC. So if you have uh, proof of concept, you want to continue with us, you can approach me anytime. Uh, we can fund you to conduct uh, a, a research, a pilot research. And then if the result look promising, then we're gonna start uh, investing in you even though it's a pre-series. Yeah, but the same as uh, Huntek say, we, in, as a corporation, we invest from Series A. If you have a, a good financial outcome in the first few years after you establish your company, yeah. We don't have ticket size, so any money, you name it. <laughs> yeah. No ceiling. No ceiling. If it's promising <laughs> enough. <laughs> if it's promising enough. I guess with that remarks, we, we open for one last time the, the questions from the audience. Go ahead. Uh, I have one question because you talk about owned about technology for physical healthcare in some in some way. I'm asking the questions that have you ever considered uh, entering the mental healthcare, which is a big business. Also. BDMS actually uh, invest. We already invest in mental health, uh, and we want to see more of the mental health uh, startup. But when you when you look at the healthcare, the healthcare is not just about uh, prevention and treatment. But we also talk about behavioral change, how you can actually convince people to change their behavior as well. So that can be another kind of startup that you can look into. Uh, we also looking at, we actually work with another university uh, from United States that we, we co-own the patent for games. So we use gamification to change people's behavior. We also use gamification to slow down uh, dementia. So that can be another arena that you can look at. Thank you. So you are talking about uh, behavior, uh, behavior change, right? Uh, how can you see with the booming of AI uh, technology right now, how, how it can change uh, the perspective of mental health care? Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, we actually have some kind of discussion a few weeks ago. Um, as I already mentioned that AI is something that's very new and we don't have a way to validate that. And when you use AI in order to predict the behavior, that can be something very difficult to validate. So that can be another issue that we have to solve before we can actually go to that direction. But I see where you come from. Yeah. Thank you. Just want to emphasize on the validation part. Uh, I think all the regulatory approval steps would eventually require you to validate what you do. So there's a software validation and AI, uh, the regulatory bodies, it's actually they are getting up to speed on that. So it's just going to speed things up or the AI engine would be as equally good as the best neurosurgeons or the best uh, cardio surgeons in the world. But you know, th there's a little bit of, of human factor that, that's still in there. And also the regulatory approval would, would require the validation anyhow. But uh, this is a, a good time to, to see more of this, more of the AI-powered uh, applications or solutions to, to enter the world. Well, we've, we've started to see quite a bit already through the USFDA as well. Uh, I, I also forgot to mention that uh, at BDMS, we have a clinical research clinic. So it means if you already have your technology or your uh, computer software that you want to launch and then test with uh, Populations, we can uh, collaborate with you, and then we can we can enroll the subject for you to do proof of concept because that's going to be another separate uh, entity that I, I can uh, collaborate with you with.